questions from this morning? Questions? Still have books to be born. Uh, I'll go up to the questions at the end of this session. I have two you want to each session. Um, anyone have a question? Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to mention that um, this is something the doctor and I were talking about. Is there a case where students are inundated with the technology in their daily lives, and probably some say that in the sixth or seventh grade, I'd say the ones who are coming here, I don't have them all available for them. And so it seems sometimes in the classroom, they're absolutely fascinated to go face to face with the human being. And then maybe PowerPoint or something as a visual, but they're actually listening to another person who's looking right at them. And, you know, that seems to be unique for them. There just isn't that much going on. So is there a way to make a commitment to the technology, but also to leave that face-to-face, -face. I really want to watch your face and see if you're touching on to what we're doing here at the... Lynn. That's actually the absolute last thing I'm going to talk about in my third talk today. Uh, it's about <laughs> social presence, about you know, how if you're using technology so much, you get that sense of caring from the instructor, the directness, the, okay. the feeling of the being with someone. Journey with uh, other students as well as with the instructor. <coughs> and there is this notion of teaching presence, social presence, and also third cognitive presence, right? So you want that just to be thinking about your teaching or instruction, but think about how students create community and, and rapport and respect and trust. You just want to think about the deep thoughts that are occurring, the cognitive presence, the reflection, the meta reflection, and all that. Those are all linked together. And so, uh, instead of just what we were doing in 1998, which was shuffleware, just shoveling up traditional courses online without much interaction, what I'm going to be doing during the next couple hours is showing you many ways to build all three things into a class. The teaching presence, your pedagogy, the cognitive presence, their reflections, their connections, their summarizations, their integrations, and the social presence, in the sense that um, I am given respect for my ideas as a student and vice versa, and then someone who's responsive to me, and there's feedback, there's caring, there's commitment, all that builds into my journey uh, and my motivational presence. And I'm going to start, actually, I kind of start and end with that, because I'm going to start on motivation. That's my first part here, so. Uh, and Lynn's fishing for answers. Well, You're fish. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, come on up to Wisconsin. You guys got a lot of lakes here too in Iowa. <laughs> More this summer. More this summer. <laughs> <laughs> Copyright and assessment. Those are the four keys. 
but you're asking about the copyright question. And uh, personally, it depends what kind of uh, resource I'm putting up. If it's a full-on book, I'm going to put it through Creative Commons. Now, Creative Commons is a way to indicate how your contents can be used. In the 80s, and some hackers kind of formed the Free Software Foundation out of MIT and, and created this notion of copyleft as opposed to copyright. And so it's kind of an interesting. Now they've moved to something called share alike. So you want to share within educational settings, you can indicate that it will only be used in, in, for non commercial purposes. If you don't want commercial uses of your ideas, then you can indicate that by going to Creative Commons, grabbing one of their logos, and indicating that under your, your contents. I think the 27 videos we're producing, I'll probably will need to put some kind of Creative Commons licensing on that content, although we're putting it up on YouTube, so I'm assuming people are going to be downloading and using them in all sorts of ways. And that's okay, but the free book I'm doing, I probably will do some kind of uh, Creative Commons. The portals I create, I tend not to put, I just say, I don't even indicate copyright, but the free book I'm putting up, I'll probably will license it. So I think it, it depends on the amount of time you devote to something, the, the possible other uses you will make with that, and your intentions of, of the idea itself. If, you're in, if you've created a simulation to teach algebra or to, you know, in chemistry, and you use it in your class, and you, don't, you, know, you never thought it could be used outside your class, you may just put it up there without any kind of licensing, and just let people use it and take off with it however they want to do it. Um, so if it's something small or something one-off, I probably would, wouldn't worry too much. If it's something much larger and grandiose with, with possible other connections, I would probably be concerned about it. Does that make sense? So Creative Commons is a place you should go to. Yeah, question. Chris, a related question, this is like a bigger like ethical kind of question, is can we open source ourselves out of business? And so when there's so much, you know, free content and um, open sourcing, I mean, are there people who will still, I mean, you can you work full time and so obviously have full time benefits, um, but does it become like all the adjunct instructors who don't receive full time benefits and there's no health care and a spiraling other kind of social system? What's your first name? This? Louise. 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 Sorry. You know, she's at, Louise asked me to look into a crystal ball and we're, we're kind of look at where we're going, kind of like I mentioned that Vanderbilt Bush was able to do. Uh, one thing is that we do know that there will be more clinical people and more agile people in the future than there was in the past. That's without a doubt going to happen. Will there be any less traditional, I don't, do you have a tenure system here? Will there be any less tenured faculty? We've already seen the, the slide of tenured faculty happening during the past decade. However, will we see a decrease in universities and a decrease in the number of full-time professors is another question you can ask. I don't foresee in looking out 60 years from now, or at least the next 20, a decrease in universities. If anything, there's going to be an increase in part because there's a very small percent of the world that's gotten to higher education in the past. And I, I believe the numbers are under the 200 million or so at, at a crack at any point in time, but I, I could be wrong. But it's, it's nowhere near a billion people. We have seven, almost 6.7 billion people on the planet, right? So if you do the math, and you think about the access to higher education that's possible today, and you think about the need for that access, uh, so you look at a snowballing kind of an effect, you're gonna you're gonna see new you're gonna be seeing the newspaper new ventures, new higher education organizations come about that will be emphasized by the media, almost downplaying traditional universities without necessarily enrollments going down in traditional universities. In fact, you don't see that here on this campus this coming year, nor do we see it. Right now in Bloomington, my program, our students come, our new students I meet tomorrow, and we're exploding. So, uh, so we'll hear about these new things, and it causes us to raise questions about our own jobs, our own institutions, and so forth. But I do see, for, at least for the time being, multiple, multiple path. That doesn't mean that you don't need to innovate. It doesn't mean you don't need to find your niche. I do think that a, a lot of the private universities and public ones will need to find their special niche. I think the ones that are going to be in the most of the quandary, I think, are going to be the medium-sized regional universities, public institutions like um, 
in where I was at the University of Wisconsin, Whitewater, Oshkosh, those kinds of places have to really think about their niche in this world as things open up to be more global because typically they're service only people that were local in nature. So how do you expand your borders? I think is a, a, an important uh, and interesting thing to consider. Now, you also have to think about the institution, the skills you bring to bear, your competencies as an instructor. You're here this afternoon because full out and aware that things are changing and there is a need for reskilling and retooling. Well, one day does not make for the retooling. It has to be systemic. You have to change the culture. To change the culture means you build a laptop program, for instance, where if you get 16 hours of training like we have at Indiana, you get a laptop using your classes. You get eight hours, you get eight hours, you get a laptop. We have uh, brown bag lunches where you talk about technology. Two speakers every Thursday afternoon, you get a free lunch, you hear about things. Department meetings end where people showcase what they're doing in their departments. Uh, we have an instructional consulting office with support for people. We have a multi-pronged approach. So, yes, our roles will change, but the institution has to help us within that role. Can't be only yourself who's making that that investment. It has to be everyone involved personally, and then the institution, <coughs> Clark University, has to provide. And they're doing that right here today. I think. I hope. Uh, providing that uh, environment in, in, in a multi-pronged, systemic, long-term visioning kind of thing about the changes that are occurring so that if there are decreases from 3,742 universities that we have in the United States to 3,100 or whatever in 20 years, that you won't be one of the 700 that's left behind. Well, or that, you know, that maybe shifts into something else or merge or something like that. A lot of this is unknown, but I think the best way is to be proactive and to, uh, to think about niches, to think about students, to think about populations, and to think about the faculty training and all that. Um, I don't think we'll see, a, as I said, a decrease in the number of people wanting higher education. How they get that higher education, whether it's from a for-profit, whether it's from an online, whether it's from a face-to-face -face or a blended or a hybrid, that's still in the works, so probably all that. That's part of an answer. This is much, it's a big, big, big question. I probably should, should move on to uh, think about mucho motivation, myths, magic, and mucho this motivation. This computer now. On uh, this computer here was, you know, the Tandy Radio Shack computer, and what it had, we had uh, 48K of max RAM. <laughs> I could handle one PowerPoint slide. <laughs> if you were happy with that, if you remember that, back in the, you know, late or early 80s, I guess, I was using Lotus 123 and Visicel. You know, those remember visit Cal, they're old like me. My boss would hide all my spreadsheets and budget estimates in a drawer because he didn't believe anything off a personal computer. He didn't believe anyone needed a personal computer. We were IBM mainframe true blue all the way. We designed circuit boards. We manufactured, designed, uh, sold, sold software actually. And that company, a few years after going public, went under because they really didn't change with the times. Um, we made some of those highly dense circuit boards out there in the, in the early 80s in Milwaukee. He didn't think I should get this computer here to process information, <laughs> only the information which is put. Now we got double that with the Commodore 64, right? Or almost double. We got two PowerPoint slides, we got color, you know, and a couple floppy disk drives, and, you know, times change. Now I actually have this next computer. That's actually what my first uh, personal computer looked like. Some of you got Apple computers, which are Right now, fish, fish bowls and stuff like that. There is a human to do a machine's job. Okay. That was the 80s, and today we've got technology wrapped around us again. We're always inundated with new technologies, as I said earlier. And in particular now, it's about smaller devices, CRISPR devices, um, enhanced storage devices, <coughs> and portable devices. So forth and so on. But what I think it's not just about technology, it's about nature and nurture. Nature is the technology, nurture is your pedagogy. And then uh, it's the society, people, and culture you're working with. The examples I gave in Saudi Arabia a couple of months ago are much different than the examples that I gave in Mexico three days after coming home, much different than what I gave in here in Iowa. So the people, society, and cultures matter. So it's a combination of those three, nature, nurture, and culture that all mix together. We're going to focus on the nurture side of things here. We're going to focus on motivation in particular. Because a lot of students in particular are, are not excited and enamored with uh, a lot of their classes that they take in high school and college. And so 
I've designed a way for us to think about motivation. The thing is, Bob, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that I just don't care. <laughs> That's my son going to college, you know, and my daughter's favorite movie, Office Space, you know. A lot of these kids are bored. They don't have intrinsic feel for things. Intrinsic motivation, a love for learning, a zest. I bought this book in Chicago Airport yesterday on the way here, signed. I got two copies, if anyone has a lot of money and wants to give me the other signed copy. Um, Marshall Goldsmith's uh, book, uh, Mojo, how to get it, how to keep it, uh, and how to get it back if you lose it. Mojo and Nojo. And a lot of students are in Nojo land. Or extrinsically being reinforced instead of intrinsically being reinforced. But my friend John Sidney Brown says that minds need to be on fire. And that, you know, with authentic kinds of learning pursuits, with meaningful real-world data that students can collect, analyze, share, collaborate, uh, team, do teamwork on, we can put minds on fire, what I'll call jumbo motivation. Uh, but it says, you know, today for the first time, kids can create knowledge, remix knowledge of other people, and use that knowledge. We're in this Web 2.0 space where my students write books with other students, as I said, wiki books online. Here's the plan. Okay. We get the warhead and we hold the world ransom for one million dollars. Why make trillions when we could make billions? All right. What word comes to mind when I say motivation? I'm just going to walk around the room and you just give me a word. And I see her sleeping back over here. So give me a word. Excited for that million dollars, okay? The gentleman back here is laughing. What's your name? Keith, what can be a word for motivation? Um, energized. Energized and excited is an E place, okay? Uh, the gentleman in the back, what do you got? Engaged. Uh, another E word, okay. You've been reading ahead, actually. I should probably go to the other side of the room and I'll get some D words or some B words or something else here. What do you got? Motivation. For motivation. What's the word that comes to me? I'll come back. Interested. Interested. Okay, we'll get some I words now. What's that? Meaning. There you go. Give your life some meaning. Okay, what do you got? Chocolate. <laughs> I got that back in the day down there. <laughs> Anyone else have a word for me? Raise your hand. You got a word for motivation. What words come to mind? You're smiling over here. What do you got? Fired up. Fired up. Passionate. Engaged. Excited. You got those words over there. A few men left from Barack. He's not spent his own. What's that? Investment. 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 Empowerment. All these kinds of words, right? <laughs> she does want to talk, but. Right? passed away at Michigan State, he said, you know, all these words you're talking about, you know, you got rewards right there, you got some fun, you got interaction, you've got, uh, no one said products, building products, feedback, enthusiasm, personal, familiar, challenge, meaningful, he said, it took a while, we found it meaningful, goals, all these things, important aspects, well, I've been distilling the research on motivation, I'm trying to read Ames and Ames work, they're here in Iowa, right, for a while she's now, um, Carol Ames is now a dean at Michigan State, and I think that their original work was either Iowa or Iowa State. Uh, but I've been reading a lot of different work uh, on motivation, like Cornell's work and, and all, all sorts of others that were Stipec. And um, I was at a conference in 2003, I was at an Ed Media conference, and it was in Honolulu. And after the conference, I, I took a week off, went to Maui, we did the Road to Hana. The Road to Hana has 51 one lane bridges. Has anyone ever done the Road to Hana? You know what I mean? A lot of you. Oh. It's like the whole place has been uh, a retreat for this thing. We had your annual meetings. Like, usually got one person raising their hand. That's, you know, everyone else has died on the road to Hana. Um, so you get in your, your car, and it's, you're not supposed to go beyond uh, Hana, you know, in the rental car. But I kept going around the island, went around the mountain passes and honked the horns so that no one can hit you going off. And <sighs> got out of the car, and I 
you know, um, my wife and daughter stayed in the car. My son and I got out and walked along the rock, lava rocks, and I just sat down. And I had this aha experience, this notion that now I figured out what all these motivational theorists were saying. Inside the matrix, oh. they are everyone, and they are everyone. And that's a true story. I'm sitting there, this is coming out of the road, now. that's a picture right there on, on Maui. And what I came up with was the tech variety model. Now the tech variety model, believe it or not, that's just what popped into my head. And uh, I'm sitting there, and it stands for tone or climate. Maslow said, be safe, climate, comfort, encouragement, feedback. Skinner said, you know, and I worked with Pia Skinner's husband and daughter in West Virginia for a while. Virginia University. And curiosity, fun, and fantasy. So tech, you know, the gaming people, Thomas Malone and others talked about this. And then we get variety, you know, intrigue, unknowns, autonomy, and choice. Now, the web doesn't offer that. Flexibility, autonomy, and choice, what does it give us, you know? And then we've got relevance and meaningful and authentic, as he said. Yeah, one of the big ones. And interactive, collaborative teammates. What's your name? Brad. Brad. Brad had one of the big ones. Okay. Um, what do you teach, Brad? Physical therapy. Oh, you're a part of that group. <laughs> <laughs> you gave him the answers at lunch. <laughs> Interactive, collaborative, teammate, engagement, effort. Someone said engagement, effort, excited. Tension, challenge, healing products. Piaget said, you know, the psychologist Piaget said cognitive dissonance is important. And other people will talk about product based learning. I had Seymour Packard's picture up earlier and others. Roger Shane was in Chicago about product based learning, goal driven learning. So I'm going to walk through these 10 principles and give you some examples within each one. I want you to think about the degree of time, risk, and cost associated with each example. Um, some of you want to do low risk, low cost, low time. In my book, at the end, there's a section that shows what the degree of time, risk, and cost is for each of the 100 activities. And the degree of learner-centeredness and the duration. So is it a long activity, a short activity, and so forth. I'd like for you to write down a couple of things you can use of these 40 ideas and a couple things you might be able to use, and a couple things you can't use. And we're going to break it halfway through in the chat. One thing I do in my class to get my, my students to interact and learn more is I do public commitments. What are you going to commit to in this class? With returning adult students, it's very important to get them to commit to something, because if they put down on paper or put down in front of people what they're going to do in the class, they're less likely to drop, because everyone's seen what they've committed to. They have a goal. They have a personal goal to work for us. Public commitments and expectations become important. I have them post their expectations online in Blackboard, and then I point out we will get to those in week nine or week 10. We might not get them into week one or two. Don't be so nervous, we will get to it. I then know what their expectations are. I can synthesize and distill them down into a set of expectations. If, I, if it's not in the syllabus, I can maybe add to a week of the syllabus. So expectations and commitments went a long ways in reducing my dropout from 30% to zero. Now, I was using the eight nouns activity where everyone describes themselves with eight nouns. I'm a pirate, I'm a you know, music lover, traveler, and so forth. When you get to the fourth or fifth noun, you start finding out something about yourself that even you didn't know. And it's a way to build rapport within a class and do something about other people. Favorite websites, you know, if you do any posting like that, have them all respond to each other. Don't just post things up. Don't just post what your accomplishments were last summer. Don't just post your commitments. Don't just post your eight nouns. Give feedback to each other. Every time you post, you have a requirement that you give feedback to one or two people to fill data in your activities. Not just posting your own stuff, but reading each other's and distilling it down. Now, some instructors, I have her on video, I don't have a, a, a link up here, unfortunately. She teaches French, he teaches business, they teach health. They put short one, two minute videos up about their classes. Now, last spring, a couple of my students put short one, two minutes videos about themselves up in Blackboard so they could learn a little bit because it was an online class so they could see, physically see who this other person was. So these are a couple of quick little things that can get you to think about tone or climate coming in. I might post my commitments in the class. I might post my expectations. I might post my video introduction. I might post my eight nouns, my favorite websites. One thing I did wrong a year and a half ago is have too many social ice breakers. You gotta be careful. This is fun stuff. You can have too many, and you, if you require everyone to read everyone else as a respond, it can be a lot to read and write. So two at the most, I would say. And you might even come up. Sometimes I do three, but I combine them all in one post in Blackboard. So I have a post, you know, where they're from, their hobbies, their interests, and then what they expect of the class and their commitments all in one big post, as opposed to having three different. Okay. Number two is encouragement. 
Now, at Indiana, we have a chemistry system called COM, the Computer Assisted Learning Method, that's now for biology and physics and other areas. It's a way to self-test yourself if you know the chemistry or not. If you get the question right, it will tell you you got it right before your exam. This system is available free to the world, so you might check out, check out COM, the COM system. It's being used also for advanced placement in high school, not just for college. It's being used in many areas. At the University of Alaska, they have a slice of a Dyson website for a human dissection and, and autopsies, in fact, case, case learning in the medical field, free. At Penn State, they have a free anatomy website on the muscular system. Now, the gentleman that teaches this class had 220 students in his class last year. In December alone, how many students went to his website? What do you think? 220. Any other guesses? 2,000. Any other guesses? 10,000. Who said 10,000? 220,000 people went to his website. One person can create one thing that people around the world who had all final exams in December, get the in December, 220,000 people in one month. He affected the world. I remember that his picture there, but you know, there's, there's stuff for medical field, science, vocabulary, all for computer-based feedback. Computer-based, it doesn't have to always be human-based feedback, right? You can create tutorials for students. There are free tools like Jing, J-I-N-G, where you walk your students through up to so many minutes. It doesn't allow more than like eight or 10 minutes or something like that, but I do five minute overviews. I link to the web, click on websites, and I talk students through them. There's a second one called Screener. It does the same kind of thing. You just put a headset on, click the record button, play button, boom, you're done. Simple. You can create little mini tutorials online for those nervous, intense students that we all have, especially older ones that have not ever had an experience involving blended learning or online learning or something like that. Now, I was at Franklin University two months ago, a month and a half in uh, Ohio, in, in Columbus, Ohio. I'm just speaking at Ohio State. I walked over to this gentleman here said, you know, we're doing some interesting things in forensic accounting. Our program's expanding really fast for whatever reason, Mary Franklin, in forensic accounting and uh, a lot of their MBA programs. And they do a lot of interactivities where they, they have a video that explains something to students, explains the book concepts to them, or there's an interview with someone showing a concept in action. And there's little support structures wrapped around the textbooks that they're using. Number three gets us into curiosity. Events in the news, whether it's you know uh, Pakistan's flood this past week, or uh, the uh, protests over the Islamic Center in New York, or uh, new species being found, all sorts of things in the news you can use to build curiosity in your classes. One website people during the past six months have been telling me about is this Wolfram Alpha. Has anyone heard of Wolfram Alpha? It's this guy named Wolfram, self-named uh, Stephen Wolfram. It's supposed to be the next Einstein. You type in any kind of calculus problem and it'll give you the answer. I think algebra as well, it has a database of all sorts of things. You ask what the weather is in Korea, Seoul, Korea, today it'll spit it out. It's a factually driven response system. It doesn't give you the correct answer 100% of the time. If you ask how North Korea made it into the World Cup, it'll give you the weather in North Korea. So, you know, uh, it's not foolproof, but it's pretty fascinating. Uh, I, I normally don't, I don't play games online at all, but this is one I kept inputting in. A lot of people input all sorts of questions that you have. It'll do comparison and contrast. What's the GMP of the US versus Korea? It'll give you a comparison and contrast. So it's not just factual answers. It'll do high order thinking kinds of things as well. It's worth checking out. I was told by many people to check it out, and finally I did it a month ago, and I was I'm thrilled. Curiosity Fun and Game can happen through webcamming. I have a few guest speakers this semester coming in from different places through a webcam. Free. Now, I'm not sure what you have, if you have anything like that available on your campus, but uh, you can have a simple webcam off your computer and bring people in, and you might experiment with that using Skype, for instance. You can bring people in. Has anyone ever brought a guest speaker in through something like Skype? You know, <laughs> using MSN or Skype or that was Skype? Used. Yeah, okay. Skype. Right. Yeah, a lot of the campuses are adopting what's called Adobe <laughs> Connect Pro or Breeze uh, for, for virtual conferencing. You might get into that as you move into this area. Uh, but um, 
you know, video conferencing has it's become huge. In Indiana, we have something called the you know, Internet, Indiana Studies in, in uh, International Studies in Indiana Schools, where we have people come from around the world uh, come in to show cultures. Number four gets us into um, variety. Now, in my classes, students sign up to be the cool resource provider. Everybody's a cool resource provider once in my class. That person shows us stuff that no one else knew existed. Might, if it's an online class, they post it online. If it's a face-to-face -face class, they get five minutes of class time, <coughs> maybe ten. I still lecture for the other fifty. I'm not giving up a lot. They get control for some things. I find out resources I didn't know existed. Okay. Another thing I do is called technology demonstrations, where students demonstrate technology in my classes. The technology demonstrator, if it's a good idea and I haven't demonstrated, they can delete any one assignment. But it has to be good. I'm not going to take people to a computer lab if it's not something really, you know, novel, interesting, useful, relevant, all sorts of things. So they can recommend, and I pick and choose why I'm going to have to do this technology demonstration. So those are two ones that work a lot for integrating technology in a face-to-face class or in an online class. A lot of these things will work in any setting. You know, um, if you have computer labs here, which I'm assuming you do, you can bring, sign up for them, and take them in, and the resources that they find, or most to Blackboard. Are phenomenal. Guest speakers, expert chats I mentioned. I had experts the last five weeks of the spring semester. My students loved it. So this time around, I'm adding them in a week three, week four. I have the president of ITT Technical Institute coming in to talk about online learning and the government's perception of it during the week on online learning. Um, I have people who are doing ebook research from Austin coming in the week before. And all sorts of folks. A uh, guy who did the Pocket School at Stanford. You can, you can contact. Ten people, I'll bet you seven will say yes. Three will say no. Three won't, or one will say no, two won't have the time. Six or seven will say yes. Most people you contact to be a guest expert, if you're using their book especially, bring them into your class. As I said, I brought in Telegram in my class, I brought in John Traxon in my class, I brought in Stephen Downs, the most famous education blogger from Canada. Stephen blogs on everything. His blog is called Old Daily. Um, he's in. Uh, New Brunswick, Canada. And apparently they don't have to work in Canada because he reads everything on technology or goes to every conference possible and blogs on it. He gave it my class for free, you know. Students love it. So now a little novelty with guest experts. And the M&M, &M, anything that's designated as M&M &M means a moment of magic. I didn't know if this would work or not. I've seen other people use it, but students love this last spring. They thought it was fabulous hearing from other people. And I've done stuff like it, but just not so many guests coming in. Okay. When I was a kid growing up, my uncle took me to the racetrack in Arlington every day. In the summer, my grandfather did, and my grandfather had bookies, my father had bookies, everyone had a bookie in Milwaukee. <clears throat> From Milwaukee, as they say, right? <laughs> and uh, church happens in the fall. We went to the church every day or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the priest said, who knows what a bookie is? And fifth grade kids, you know, one kid raised his hand, it's me. And I had to explain what bookies were. Well, last year I was doing the Sloan Conference in Orlando, and I was so tired, I flew, I had to talk to librarians in Chicago. I flew in, went to my hotel, napped all afternoon, woke up and looked out the window, and that's what I saw, the racetrack for the first time in 20 years. How many of you like horse racing? I don't, I can't go, I can't gamble anything. My whole family is just gamblers, you know. They, I lose everything, I can't go. But now, you know, I knew who the jockey was. I knew daily double and trifecta perfect, I knew all that stuff as a kid. But now we have Google jockeys. Google jockey sits next to you in a class and calls up websites as you talk about them. If a team is presenting, the Google jockey will be the one calling up the website the teams are presenting on. <coughs> if you're using something like PageFlakes, which has a whole bunch of links off a website, PageFlakes is a cool little tool. You can have all sorts of little, you know, web links embedded in. Or Google Sites. Google Sites, you can build your own website, right? Just click away. Like in this literature class, just click it away. for people in literature. Autonomy and choice. Have people look up famous folks. Like I talked about Thomas Friedman. Go to his blog. Go to his websites. And go to his Twitter if he uses it. Have them track someone famous in your field and write reflection papers around it. Or write to the person themselves. Autonomy and choice. Instead of getting on one case, my friend Mark, Mark Brown teaches um, uh, physiology or pathology, 
Uh, in his pathology class, he has multiple cases that students solve. They don't have to solve all of them. They have choices of the cases that they solve. That's the wonder of the web. I had a class with teacher education where the teacher or student, the pre-service teachers, are writing cases based on problems they saw in Indiana schools. And then they had to solve each other's problems. And we had students not only from Indiana, we had students from South Carolina, University, Texas A&M, students from Finland, students from Peru, students from Korea, all solving each other's problems online. We call it the Interplanetary Teacher Learning Exchange. Intraplanetary. Intraplanetary. That's title project. That was kind of fun. Relevance or meaningfulness. Now this woman's an actress. She summarizes books in 60 seconds. In video. <laughs> Cliff notes in video. She does 10 of them for each book. The theme, the characters, the plot, the subplot. And she's really good. Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Great Expectations, Catcher in the Rye. Also, you know, if you have high school kids in, in literature, you might check out 60 Second Recap. Cliff Notes in Video. Relevance and Meaningfulness. If you're in engineering area, environmental science area, all this data available from BP on the oil spill today, you know, if you're in the petroleum engineering in particular, there's lots of relevant, meaningful questions or about morals and ethics and all sorts of things. Number seven, interactive and collaborative. I mentioned language learning earlier. Having Skype, or a student might listen to a language expert <coughs> in Spanish or Portuguese. Or learning Chinese, like I did from this woman here, popped into my MSN account and said, hey, I want to teach you something. I heard you signed up to learn Chinese, and I have. I went to this website called Mixer, and, I, and she, she said, okay, I'll teach you. Uh, Chinese, and she did it a little bit. Language learning is exploding. Any language people in the room here? Oh, what area is French? Spanish. 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 What other areas besides Spanish? Spanish pod. Um, there's also a couple culture clubs on a cafe, Spanish cafe or something like that. There's a lot of really cool sites. I actually have a wiki website. If you go to my own page, you can click on the wiki, wiki, it's called the wiki, wiki, and there's all these language sites linked in. I've been exploring this for a while. A little pet project of mine. Collaboration and name I mentioned. The name thing. Mark and recent I said we built Netscape built name. Um, there are name sites for educators. There's college instructor name sites. There's student. Well, the way to use it in class might be to have students watch what goes on in a name site and reflect on. Be a, be a novice being apprenticed in the community and write papers on that. Or have them create a name group. Now again, Ning's all of a sudden costing money. Google Groups does not cost money. Yahoo Groups does not cost money. I like Ning better, but okay, there are other ones out there. Google Documents I mentioned earlier. In Google Documents, you can basically share documents online and collaboratively write them and upload them. Or a spreadsheet and vote on things in the spreadsheets. So Google Documents and spreadsheets. Encouragement and efforts. I mentioned one of the top 10 things I've ever done as, a, as an instructor, combining picture tell and CDCV and almost taking down the internet. Well now, I bring in famous people like David Merrill, the most famous instructional designer in the world, emeritus professor from Utah State. I had my students read his articles. I had my students watch a video that he had given at Florida State. And then I had my student invite him into class. And he came into my class free. After reading him, after watching him, it was a top 10 experience. And he is wonderful. Always recommend the async first and then the sync. With the async back in 1995, they hated David Palumbo's ideas from Houston. They hated Elliot Soloway's ideas from Michigan. We brought him into class live and they nodded their heads yes for everything they had to say. <laughs> First, they bashed them in Blackboard or whatever we were using back in 95. They totally demolished, they hit every idea. And the fact is, most students today are trained to be critical. Trained to be negative, maybe not critical. Trained to be too often trained to be negative. So I often have a plus minus interesting, and an interesting problem has all the positives. You know, because no one wants to have anything positive to say about somebody nowadays. Anyway, that's a little side comment. This technique, doing an async and then a sync, whacks them in the side head, kicks them in the seat of the pants, and gets them to say, <laughs> so maybe I might want to major in this as my occupation. Or this person had something relevant. Maybe, maybe one idea doesn't represent a person. Maybe their article they wrote from 1992 no longer applies to them. They've moved on to other things, you see. Students too often overgeneralize. This is a way to break them from that overgeneralization. 
engagement effort, if you want to show the Enron crisis in two minutes with a flash animation, you can do it and explain years of what happened in Enron with a short little flash animation or a chemistry experiment or randomization of groups and statistics. Any stat professors here? Stat instructors, math? You know, randomization of groups, chi-square, whatever. Um, business cash flow, any business professors here? You know, with flash animations. Engagement and effort. You know, there's a museum of online museum, or MOM, M-O-O-M, which is an index of all the other museums of the world. The Louvre, <laughs> the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, and Smithsonian as well. You can explore many of these museums. You can go right to the Louvre, the British Museum, the Smithsonian, and the little 3D worlds today. But there's actually this M O O M that's an index for all of the museums that are digital in nature. Challenge number nine is challenge and debates. You can debate stem cell research. You can debate stem cell research in the human body world's exhibit, or whether North Korea is right for asking Japan for an apology now. It's an interesting thing. North Korea asking for an apology. They got one. You can debate this, this Iran unveiling a long range bombing drone yesterday, or day before yesterday, in the news with CNN. All sorts of things. Every day in the news to debate. Challenge. You can bring in challenge by having mentors come into your class. I had a guy called a mentor from Michigan, a high school teacher, had a PhD in physics, and never got a chance to teach college. So he mentored my students and gave them feedback on thousands of cases they wrote on problems in schools in Indiana, all for free. There are people out there that are crazy, they need, they need that experience of teaching college, they're there to mentor, guide, but they're also in the corporate world. When they get to the corporate world, they can pick a mentor sometimes online. We need to prepare them for that. Higher ed is not taking advantage of mentoring as much as we can. Students producing products. I don't have an internet connection here, but you'll have the slides. You can watch these three videos of my students doing summary products in YouTube summaries of what they've learned in YouTube. Powerful when they can do a quick three, four minute video storytelling that synthesizes all that they've learned. Or doing a video blog, having a blog written with a video reflection of themselves talking about their weekly learning in my class or their learning across the semester. So I have my students doing video blogs or YouTube-like videos or in some people's cases, in a photo media area, you might have competitions of digital photo media. Like my friend here, Rick uh, Bennett at the University of New South Wales. Any photo media people in the room here? <coughs> so he has a website called the Omnium Project, which gets groups online to do online co cooperation and collaboration and competitions. Okay, that's the tech variety model. Tone, encouragement, curiosity, variety, autonomous, relevance, interactivity, tension, and yielding products. How many of you got zero ideas so far? <laughs> How many of you got just one? You can raise your hand. How many of you got two, three, four to five, five to ten, more than ten? Okay, I want you to turn this on next to you for 99 seconds. Tell them a couple of things that you can use from there. I mean, a couple of things you can't use. There are a couple of solid things and a couple of fuzzy things. I'll be back in 99 seconds to give you my R2D2 model. <laughs>
think you got a lot of good ideas out of that section. As you can see, compared to this morning, which is more big picture, there's more specific kinds of things that you can utilize in your class. Here, um, there'll be more. Uh, who, who heard an interesting idea from someone else that you hadn't heard of before, or an interesting application from somebody else? Any interesting stories? Anything you can steal from somebody else? Yeah? Well, there's the idea that students are going to do um, a project. Um, they, you can offer it in gradations where the ones who know how to incorporate more of the visuals and the YouTube part and, and taping themselves and all that, let them do that and let them each do a presentation to the best of their own abilities, accommodating every you know everybody's development and technology. Are you seeing these students face to face? Are these face to face students? Well, or are they on the two of, we were talking, and some of his aren't, and all of mine are. Okay. We have a lot of what are called hybrid classes where you see them sometimes, but then. This is what I did. <clears throat> yeah, exactly what, let's see, you can have them line up <laughs> non-verbally from most confident to least confident that day you meet the first week, and have the most confident meet the least confident, and they become partners. So the person who's really com comfortable with the technologies might meet someone who's not as comfortable able to walk that person in, and that's a tough man to go with the fish. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else hear something interesting? Yeah. Book. in a different way. 
The second model I have is related to Star Wars. It's called the R2-D2 model. And hence why I'm dressed this way. And on my real lightsaber, I couldn't bring through the airport, so they gave me this one. But I do have a real one. As you can see, it lights up. And we have battles in my classes. And, you know, someone actually took a great time to jump. I could kill myself. Are you a princess and a guy like me? No. Okay, so we're going to give away one of those books. Uh, we were going to call it R2-D2, but as you can see, it's, it didn't, uh, George Lucas wouldn't let us, so um, it's a long story, um, but it is in the book, the R2-D2 model. I, I have my syllabus for 15 years, read, reflect, display, and do. Somebody said, Dr. Bump, do you know that that spells R2-D2? Okay, sounds great to me. Um, so actually, a professor at Texas Tech asked me to speak in her class about my R2-D2 model. I said, what R2-D2 models? Look at your syllabus. So I did. And then we got done. She said, how would you like to write an article on your R2-D2 model? So we did. And then she said, let's write a book together. And so she's the co-author of this book. That's a true story. Yeah, I'm getting a little red. You know, that's the choice because you are in trouble. Oh, she is still in that. Okay, let's take a look at the first part. I love to stay still this. Auditory and verbal learners, right? How many of you are auditory? That's people. Text like text. Okay. Phase one. How about all those open access journals out there? As I mentioned earlier, over a thousand in North America alone. In my area of educational technology, we have all sorts of EDUCAUSE quarterly and review and distance learning, but in, in the science areas, there's the Public Library of Science, PLOS, making genetics journals, chemistry journals, sorts of medical journals free the world. And I'll talk more about that. But open access journals for text-based learners. All this text that Lou was talking about that's online. He's texting right now. Twitter. This professor at the University of Texas at Dallas uses Twitter to update his students about course content, about what's going on in his class. Podcasts. How many of you listen to a certain podcast on a regular basis? How many of you created your own podcast? Anyone create a podcast with video wrapped around your podcast? What, what do you teach? Art history. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. What's your name? Brian. Yeah. How long have you been doing it? Uh, off and on for about eight, well, eight months. Does it work? Yeah. How, how long are the podcasts? Four minutes, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Podcasts in the medical field are just exploding. Whether you're teaching nursing, you know, cardiovascular care, uh, in the English field as well. This gentleman teaches in the dentistry program in Michigan. The dentistry program in Michigan is all up online as podcasts. Mm -hmm. Again, as I said at dinner last night, I don't want my dentist only learning through podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> More text-based learning with Wiki How, learning the steps of how to do something, how to write a resume, how to run a marathon, how to interview for a job, how to kiss on a first date. <laughs> Along Wiki How. Number two, reflective and observational learning. Okay, phase two. You know, a long time ago they said I look like Luke, but now they say I look like Yoda. I have a side. Here's my students in critical friend activities. I got G.I. Jane here and DePauli. They're critical friends. They gave feedback on their work every week. If they didn't do that, Students don't feel there's a sense of caring, a sense of social responsiveness. If the instructor is the only one giving feedback, you will die. Because students tend to write seven, eight, ten things a week. If you have 20 or 30 students in a class, that's two, three, four hundred places to give feedback. You cannot do that. So critical friends, experts, practitioners, all sorts of ways to get feedback. Self-feedback, self-reflection, machine feedback. You can give some, but you can't be the only source. You always be the first one to respond to a controversial topic. And always be the last one to respond. It'll make you look like you're in all the time. <laughs> I was in Finland, I was in Sweden, uh, back in 1999 at a conference, and, and he said, look at the post where we analyze your, your classes, you know, and my students, some people in Finland, some people in the U.S. were working, and I said, Dr. Bonk, you're in, but you're never there. So what do you mean? So said, well, students in Finland, thanks for responding all the time. We called it up, you're only 2% of the post. Find the controversial topics. Always be the first one, second one in, and then be the last one in for all the, the major posts to be the last one and the last say, or one of the last people, anyhow. So critical friends is a good thing. Uh, blogging. 
How many of you have your own blog? How many of you read a blog of someone else's on a regular basis? Quite a few. Interesting. You know, you can have cultural blogs. This is uh, Kim Foreman who passed away in Rwanda two weeks ago. This is her husband who does missionary work with her, but she has a website called Come and See Africa. They're creating a, uh, they had a Bible study institute and all sorts of things there in, in Rwanda. Uh, but cultural blogs, your students can create cultural blogs on different countries or cultures of the world. Expert blogs, whether we're talking about English or we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about the Wall Street Journal and business or nursing. Almost every discipline has 10, 20, 30 expert blogs that your students could be reading, reflecting on, in addition to reading the books. Why not read from a real world practitioner and do reflection papers, or at least one reflection paper, on reading from a bunch of blog posts? Case based learning. The medical field, the business fields in particular, are loaded with cases online. Almost every field has a set of cases that are free of the world that your students can analyze, many with real world data. Real world reenactments. In Second Life, often Shakespearean plays are reenacted. You could reflect on them. Podcasts, all Shakespearean plays are at, at shakespearecast.com. I sat with the headphones on one day and listening to Shakespeare Cast. My wife comes down to wax me head. She's supposed to be preparing for that talk at, in Iowa. And I said, Well, I'm just really enamored with the Shakespeare Cast. I'm not, norm normally, I'm not one that, you know, but, but this is really fascinating. Workplace reflections. Now, since 1996, I've been doing online workplace reflections so that my pre-service teachers reflect on the content and reflect on their school internships. And they'll see that one bad internship doesn't mean that everybody has a bad internship. They don't need to drop out of teacher education just because they had one bad experience, because they read 29 other ones that are good ones. And I can point out what they connected with and what they didn't connect with, what concepts they got, what concepts they didn't get. Field reflections connect everything together. You can have them focus on particular concepts that they're trying to learn. If you have a internship in your field, if you have a practicum, if you have any kind of field placement, summer uh, volunteerism even. Online resource library, I mentioned that Lou caught on this early. Um, this is the remodeled library of Ohio State where I was a month ago or so. Fantastic place, but I have this activity where students read 15 articles and summarize them in one week. Normally I give them three. I thought they would hate me to give them 15, you have to summarize them. I want them to learn what it's like to write a master's thesis someday or write a dissertation. I want them to feel, feel that pain. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to find, you know, it's like a qualifying exam, find, synthesize in one or two pages maximum, synthesize, and then bring them to my physical face-to-face -face class, if it's a face-to-face -face class, the first page of every article we talk. They found they loved this is the best week of the semester because they got control. I control 14 weeks, and they control one. They love it. So I had two weeks. Two weeks, you got to find 30 articles. They love that too. So I call it online library week. I do it in the middle, week seven and eight now of the semester. It frees up a little bit, gets students some power. I still control the class. It pushes them into areas that they want depth in. One of my students might want to be an elementary school principal someday, so she can go into depth on that. Someone else wants to be a counselor, he can go into depth on that. You see, library day. And there's so much available online to find in the fields. Why not go there? Books. Many books today have videos and discussions and reflections with the author. This book, Brain Rules. Has anyone seen this book, Brain Rules? It's a bestseller. The author from the uh, University of Washington explains every chapter in a two, three, four minute video. You've seen it. Pretty, pretty really good. He's dynamic, actually. Yeah. This, is, this is a pretty popular one, but you might find them in your field. Big Think. If you haven't seen Big Think, you might want to take a look at Big Think. Uh, Big Think is a website for pithy videos, not all pithy, but mostly two, three, four minute short videos from Deepak Chopra on religion or Sir Richard Branson on Virgin Airlines or you know, whomever. This guy teaches the happier course at Harvard, the largest class at Harvard. Thousands of students enroll in his class. Short little video on his book, Happier. You want to be happier. Everybody wants to be happier. This is a great website for reflection on, in this case, living longer, in this case, being happier, and so forth and so on. Think, think. Pick up the original camera. Visual Here right. Stay on target. We're too close. Stay on target. I can't see it. Flow charts, timelines, pictures, diagrams. <laughs> Part. Three, part three, podcasts. We have science people. I know you guys have been saying science.
science to me. I mean, where's Melissa? Melissa, there you are. Science, right? You said last night, well, science, huh? Okay, so what did she do? Do that, didn't she, last night? I want you to talk about science! Okay, I'm embarrassing her now. She's turning all red. Your dress is anyhow turning red. Okay. Sorry, Melissa. But you did say, she did say, it'd be great if we had. So I think you said you've seen this slide. This slide here, yeah, the authors reflect on their articles. So you can hear what got the article, what was deleted. Most of the time, articles get published and half of them is cut. What was cut? Where is your research going now? What were the limitations? All this stuff is in SciV. Science Visualized. Pretty cool website from the Public Library of Science, which offers free journals. Now we get free journals, we get free scientists talking about there are publications. Students get bored reading vanilla bland books. What if they see the person? Connect with the person. To me, this is where we're going. We're going to have more text be enhanced through video and animations. I believe that video is part of the answer solution to engaging our students better. And the notion of anchored instruction created at Vanderbilt University in 1984-ish having a short video clip from CNN anchoring your discussion of economics or whatever topic it is that you happen to be teaching. In my case, I'm talking about new technologies. So I have someone coming into my class talking about new technologies. That's, um, of course, I'm blanking on his name for a second, Alan Kay. And Alan Kay created the first um, notebook computers 30, 40 years ago. GUI interfaces, all sorts of things. And we watch a video explaining where things are going. We watch B.F. Skinner. We watch uh, Sir, Sir uh, Ken Robinson talk about creativity in schools. Little videos that can anchor instruction. You can come back to it and replay it. It's a macro context to come back to. I wrote an article on 20 ways to use video in the classes. 10 ways from a student's point of view, or student-centered, and 10 that are instructor-centered. If you go to publicationshare.com, you can have that article. If you go to trainingshare.com, you can have all the links to all the shared video I put up. So, there's many of these websites. I mentioned earlier, Clip Chef to learn how to cook. Um, I mentioned um, Link TV for National Geographic Specials. I did mention Wonder How To and Howcast. If you're having trouble with your plumbing at home, you want to fix your toilets, check out how, you know, if you want to learn how to run a marathon, shoot a bow and arrow. Bowling, I guess we have some bowling experts here. Um, it's on Howcast and Wonder, you want to learn how to Digital camera, the digital camera, I wonder how to help us. Chemistry people, who's the chemistry in here? Free website from the University of Nottingham that shows all the chemical symbols and I'll have an experiment wrapped around it. You've seen it before. Um, this nutty here professor has put up stuff on iron and sodium and all sorts of things. It's all free to the world. Why? He had a grant funding from his country, then he made it, he didn't put Creative Commons thing on it, anyone can use it. Concept mapping, putting your knowledge on display for others to see. Timelines. There's many concept mapping tools today. Glyphy, MindMeister, MindDouble. The one I use is Bubble.us. Simple little tool. Been complaining about this for a decade. Inspiration was the thing we used in 1995. It was not web-based. Now it is. Finally, it's beta web-based. It might be available. No, for 10 years we've needed the tool, and all of a sudden, all these appear like magic, and they're all free. Why not give it a go? I think thought on paper or online is what we need to display. And when you have thought on paper, you can write papers from it. When you have thought visualized, you can do collaboration from it. When you have thought visualized, you have debates from it. Concept mapping, timelining. You have Bill Gates' life on a timeline, all free from the USA Today. You have Chief Steve Jobs' life on a timeline. You have the presidents of the U.S., all the presidents, JFK, FDR, they're all on the timeline from the University of North Texas, all free. You can explore their life in depth. Eisenhower, Willis, you name it. World Mapper Tool. The World Mapper Tool is a database of world information, whether it's pancreatic cancer deaths, science growth around the world, where countries are growing in science. Not the U.S., not South America, yes, parts of Asia, parts of Europe. Where are his, uh, pancreatic cancer deaths uh, more apparent? You can find that on the map. Where is youth literacy a problem? Where is, how much do we spend on educational funding? You can compare that. It's called the World Mapper Tool, and that's free. I mentioned the United States, or United Nations Digital Library, another free tool 
for cultures of the world. You want to learn about Korea? One of my favorite places in the world, you click on Korea. You want to learn about Brazil, parts of Latin America, Africa? You click and you go into the resources that are peer-reviewed and put up. Visualizations in the weather. Any meteorology people in the room? Probably not, but there's a pretty interesting website. History. The British Library has scanned in historical documents from Mozart. Yeah, we're music people, right? Mozart and, and, and uh, Beethoven. Uh, they also have Michelangelo and, and Da Vinci. Um, really Magna Carta, all sorts of original works been scanned in. The original writing of Mozart. And then there's an audio file explaining what he was doing at that point in time in his life. <coughs> this has all been made available through something called Turning the Pages. You type in Google, Turning the Pages. You want Jane Austen's work, Hemingway's work, Turning the Pages. History portals. There's a couple on the civil rights recently that have marches from the civil rights, interviews from the civil rights, protests, CIA records, all sorts of things. One is called Amistad, and one is called the Civil Rights Digital Library. Medical animations in YouTube to see gastric bypass surgery. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> My daughter took an, uh, an anatomy class this summer, and the professor who taught it has this online website on um, human embryology. And um, her name's uh, uh, Valerie Laughlin. She's come to my class to speak a couple of times. And now my daughter Heather is, is an instructor. It's kind of interesting to, uh, to see her use these, these websites to supplement her book. She had a regular textbook with these web supplements, with exams, practice exams. Any uh, architecture, drawing, people in the room that have seen Google Sketch, SketchUp? You can see bridges, stadiums, and points of interest around the world in Google SketchUp. Pretty interesting website. Right? Sociology. I know we have sociology people in the room because I read yeah, she got a book earlier. Well, this guy here helped the sociology class at SUNY, uh, SUNY Oswego, I believe it was. And the students at SUNY Oswego went around the U.S. recreating Jack Kerouac's On the Road book. And they recorded sounds of cities. And they indexed the sounds of cities with Google Maps. They, tried, they mashed up. They spent the first week of the semester doing this. Then they came back to class for 14 weeks to talk about what they indexed around the country. It's an interesting way to do sociology. Oh, we're not going to meet the first week. You're going to travel the world. <laughs> Imagine that. And then we'll come back and we'll meet week two or week three or whenever it is. Archaeology online in the archaeology circle in the room. There's a number of these websites available for exploring Mayan ruins or ancient Rome or whatever. Finally, kinesthetic rooms. Phase four. We'll take a 15 minute break after phase four. A few examples here. I mentioned Wikibooks. My students wrote books last year at the Wikibooks website. The Wikibooks website is a free website with over a thousand free books created by the same people who brought you Wikipedia. Now you can use Wikispaces, which is also free. You can use Wet Paint, PB Works. These are all free wiki tools. I'm using PB Works and Wikispaces for all my class projects. But for, week, for book related, I'm using the Wikibooks website. They'll make your book available to the general public on their bookshelf when it gets good enough. There's books on Ukrainian dancing. There's books on the Beatles, bicycling. You know, the European culture, you name it, you'll probably find a book on it. Do you want to use it? As was the question, it's not vetted. Do you want to use this? You have to decide. That's, that's your choice. But I think we can have students create books. I have a colleague who had his students create a book. His name is Dwight Allen, and he, is, he created the concept of micro-teaching, where you practice your teaching and you watch on video. He also had Bill Cosby as his first doctoral student at Massachusetts, the comedian. Bill Cosby and him have a book. Well, at age 75, he was ready to retire, and he started doing wiki books before retiring. So he said, you're a professor, experimenting with wiki books. And he had his students all write a chapter for the wiki book. 300 students in the class. It's a big class at Old Dominion. And every, there were 100 chapter books, 1,000 words each. Three students wrote each chapter, and the students voted on which one of the three they liked best, and that went in the book. Interesting idea. Syllabus. My friend Ron Ostin takes a high risk and has his students help him write a syllabus in a wiki and have him write his wiki lesson plans in a wiki. I think he's crazy. 
is that York University, he's a Canadian, all these Canadians experiment with all sorts of things that we can learn from the Canadians, but um, he's using Moodle and he's using Awakening. Market analysis. I developed a tool called SurveyShare, which I recently sold. I no longer have any ownership, so I can promote it if I want. Um, Zoomerang, SurveyMonkey, all these tools are out there for surveys. Polling, Mr. Poll, Micro Poll. Students can collect real world data and analyze it. Just in time teaching, having your students do warm up activities online, practicing something. So you might have them, in this case, this professor teaches physics and his students do a warm up activity on Wednesday mornings. He changes his Wednesday afternoon lectures based on the results of the online quiz. Warm up activities on the web. My student, Teresa went back to Taiwan after getting her master's with me. She teaches English to engineering students. He has them all do podcasts. They do podcasts of old Beatles songs to learn English. She's a little creative type. So that's the tech variety model. How many of you got a few ideas you can use from the tech variety model? Wrote some things down. Okay, let me just point to a couple. Anything you can think of that you can use? You want to raise your hands? After three, we're going to take a break. Yes, one. Field reflections. Field reflections, yes. Expert blog. Expert blogging. Anchor instructions. Anchor instructions. Yeah, your hand up here. Yeah. What's that? The world mapper. The world mapper. The Wiki How, how to interview leadership. Wiki How. The history of all the history. All those histories. A lot. Do you teach history? Mm -hmm. No, all those history ones. Do a lot. As I say, yeah. Library day. Library day, yeah, library day. Oh, by the way, I haven't heard from anyone in this row. They're just sleeping on the case-based learning. Case-based learning. Case -based learning. Yeah, it's a scenario-based learning. Case-based, I'll talk more about that here after break. Anyone over here? Oh, why over there? Okay, let's take a, there's a lot there. Let's take a 15-minute break. We'll see you at five minutes after three for the last section on the